the United States government, along with other governments of the world, has been totally denying the existence of unidentified flying objects that were not of earthly origin, knowing full well that we do have visitors, knowing full well that these objects are here, that they are of extraterrestrial origin. was forecast by Werner von Braun, the uh, top German rocket scientist who was brought to the United States right after World War II to make sure that his knowledge didn't get into the hands of the Soviets. And he said first it's going to be the communists, then it's going to be the terrorists, and then it's going to be extraterrestrials. But well, this is what's happening. There's no question there's a government cover-up. The question, of course, is why? When I worked here at the Hayden Planetarium like 30 years ago, I worked with a brilliant woman named Dr. Margaret Mead. It turns out that 30 years before that, she was part of a government NASA study formed when NASA was formed that basically said, if we find evidence of aliens out there, we can't tell the American people because civilization will be destroyed. It's too bad I didn't know then what I know now. About 90% of the human beings on this planet are asleep. They have no idea what's going on in the real world. They live in a little illusional world of their own. And the greatest story in human history is unfolding around them, and they haven't a clue. Governments frequently interfere in the process of perception. They, they distort the lens. Uh, they do it through various techniques, certainly propaganda is well known, where they put out direct false information in the media and what have you to give a false perception of events, of history, of what's going on, thus corrupting the worldview of their citizens. Uh, the UFO ET issue is, in fact, an example. The cover-up worked like this. We consistently downplayed the true extent of both our interest in and involvement with this phenomenon. And we routinely told the British Parliament, the media and the public that UFOs were of no defence significance, when all the while, behind closed doors, we were looking at this very seriously. I'm curious like everybody else. I want to know. I mean, the truth needs to come out. If there is really visitation to Earth and there are cosmic cultures coming here, I think I'm just the spokesperson for the average intelligent human being. One of the cases that we have featured in our book, in the Wonders in the Sky, is an observation by Michelangelo, who saw what he called a luminous sign of three luminous objects in the sky that he saw long enough that he could uh, remember them very clearly and he painted, he did a painting of them. If this is really true, if we're having visitations, and they're not only now, they happened in ancient times and we've had some proof that in ancient times visitors from ancient cultures have come here, then let's face it, we're going to have to rewrite all of our history. In 1947, after the UFO crash in Roswell, New Mexico, President Truman assigned 12 men to study and classify all of the information about UFOs, and above all, to keep it hidden from the American people. The secret group called Majestic 12 had a conflict with one of their members, Secretary of Defense James Forrestal. He wanted to reveal the truth to the American public. 
Instead, he was admitted to the Bethesda Naval Hospital, where he fell from a high window to his death. Of course, they claimed it was a suicide. Today, almost 60 years later, all of the original Majestic 12 members are dead, and 12 new members have taken their place. But do you, the average person, know about any of this? I know, I'm not gonna say I believe, I know that we have objects that are reported as unidentified flying objects, UFOs, that do not originate on this planet. That they are under intelligent control and they come from some other planet, from some other solar system. You can understand why the U.S. government might have wanted to keep uh, the alien secret, as it were, away from public knowledge uh, 50 or 60 years ago. Uh, just after the crash at Roswell in 1947, which is where it all started, uh, not, it wasn't the first crash, but the, sort of the one that got people interested. Um, the, the, the world was different at that time. It was just after World War II. People were tired of war, and they probably wouldn't have wanted to, uh, to know that uh, we were being visited by people from outside of our planet. Make no mistake about it. Technology acquisition lies at the heart of UFO secrecy, lies at the heart of government um, kind of policy on this. Certainly in the United Kingdom, and I'm sure too, in the United States, in Russia, in China, all around the world. There's an organization that was formed after the Paris Peace Conference, after World War I, called the Council on Foreign Relations. And that is what I view as the U.S. branch of the world government. They control all the major media. And you can't get nominated to be president of the United States, whether it's Democrat or Republican, without being approved by the Council on Foreign Relations. They have grooming programs. Rhodes Scholars, Fulbright Scholars, Skull and Bones even, are grooming people for world service. Whenever you get elected president, you wear two hats. You wear a U.S. hat and you wear a world government hat. So the alien issue is something that a president is briefed on after he's elected. Before he takes office, he's briefed on again. After he takes office, uh, Bill Casey gave Reagan a one-hour briefing in late January 81. And then Reagan got an all-day briefing by Bill Casey in uh, March of 81. That same thing happens to all presidents now, I think. He's given enough information for him to absorb, to realize why it's so important not to have disclosure or too much disclosure before it's time. Now I know that the government has plans that when the common enemy was no longer communism and then it became international terrorism and when that doesn't hold up anymore, then it's going to be a threat from space. Well, how are you going to make people believe there's a threat from space if nobody believes there's anything intelligent out in space? So now we're being conditioned to the idea that there really is something there. And that's why you see these incremental uh, stories and releases of information in the media. Things flying over New York, things flying over Stephenville, Texas. Uh, Stephen Hawkins comes out and says, yeah, there's probably intelligent life out there. NASA has in incrementally uh, told us the moon is a dead airless planet. Oh, well, wait a minute, it's got a little bit of an atmosphere. Oh, wait a minute, it's got a little bit of water. So that's why this idea of, of maybe just drip feeding the information out there and, uh, you know, surrounding it sometimes with a little bit of X-Files music, uh, a little bit of jokes about little green men and, and tinfoil hats uh, is actually the best way to do it. I mean, government is not averse to spin and dirty tricks. We know in 1977 that the United States Congressional Research Service was tasked by the, the Science and Technology Committee of the United States Congress to undertake a major investigation of the issue of extraterrestrial intelligence and the issue of the UFO phenomenon. That this was undertaken directly at the request of President Carter. And that United States government investigation concluded that there were at least from two to six highly technologically developed intelligent civilizations inside our own galaxy over and above that of our Earth. And that's an official finding of the United States government in 1977 that was submitted to the United States Congress and to the Office of the President of the United States. 99.999% of this country is completely out of the loop 
and oblivious to what is going on. There are approximately 129, 130 known underground facilities in the United States. The people that are involved in building these things and running them and utilizing these facilities uh, appear to be operating outside the Constitution. And if they're getting away with this, uh, who knows what else they could get away with. I had met with Edgar Mitchell, Apollo 14, and basically Edgar Mitchell made a very powerful statement as to the fact that Roswell was real, that he had called the Pentagon, that his Pentagon source had said Roswell was real, that this subject matter is highly classified, that he can't even get to the truth of it, that most presidents can't get to the truth of it. If I don't believe Edgar Mitchell, who's an astronaut, if I don't believe a Colonel Philip Corso who worked in the Pentagon and back engineering alien technology, then who do we believe? I grew up with astronauts, Gus Brisson, Gordon Cooper, John Glenn. Uh, I have two godfathers who walked on the moon. My little brother's godfather is Gene Cernan, who also walked on the moon. So we have astronauts all through our family. When I was a kid, Gordon Cooper was, and Gus Grissom were the two who first talked about how they'd seen uh, UFOs outside the spacecraft. And they could see them through the windows, and they would bring home uh, uh, film in these little Bell and Howell 8 millimeter cameras with little wind up doohickeys on them that uh, they would take from space and show these craft that were flying around the, the, uh, the, the capsules. throughout the universe. We're not alone in the universe. people will take their own lives because they will not be able to cope with it. I can tell you from being in the military and I can tell you from the perspective of the recovery teams, there have been people that were in the military that wasn't ready to accept that. And some of them took their lives. There had been a scare. Uh, Orson Welles had put on a show, a radio show, one Halloween night, based on H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, with the Martians uh, invading Syracuse, and uh, it, was, it really created a panic. So, you know, th there was this fear, I guess, well, if people know what's going on, they will ra react in, a, in an unpredictable way. I know of one incident where a person took an M-16 and blew the top of his head off simply because he couldn't cope with the fact that he knew he came into something that was not of this world, that it didn't originate on this planet. He was very religious, and it was, I don't know how to put it, like an assault on everything he believed, everything that he held as being true.
The Roswell crash of July of 1947 has now been established to have been an historical fact because we were able to recover the photographs that were taken of General Ramey in July of 1947, which he was displaying the false wreckage of a weather balloon. And in his hand, he had the telegram that he'd received from Washington. And it said directly in the telegram, when we digitized the negatives and blew them up, it says, bring the bodies from the crash site uh, to Wright-Patterson in Ohio. So we know that that's an historical fact. I had an acquaintance, Lieutenant Colonel Philip Corso, who was the head of Foreign Technology Division at the Pentagon for the Army. And he stated in his book, The Day After Roswell, that an alien spaceship crashed in the desert in 1947 in New Mexico, and that he had the debris from this craft, and he gave pieces of it to various laboratories and research institutes, and they came up with lasers, fiber optics, and integrated computer chips. He also claimed that he had seen a humanoid type alien. It's amazing that people don't realize that the advances in technology over the last 50 years are due to the crash of an alien spaceship in 1947. And the fact that Colonel Corso fed this data out to the giants of American industry and today our world has changed. We've had advances in the last 50 years in technology greater than in the last couple thousand years of history. At that time, just the beginning of the Cold War, the Americans were just absolutely petrified that the Russians might get access to the same uh, technology. When I was 16 years old and saw seven red light type UFOs flying around over Washington, D.C. 26 July 1952 made headlines around the world. That was the second Saturday night in a row that alien vehicles put on a demonstration to the extent that the media could not ignore it and the government couldn't cover it up. With regard to the Project Blue Book uh, study that was undertaken by the United States Air Force of the UFO phenomenon, we know perfectly well that that, that classified report has sections in it that have never been revealed to the public. Uh, and so that while they were attempting to debunk the phenomenon, we have actually, I've actually gotten to see sections of the classified photographs that show a crashed disc on the ground uh, with foreign symbols on it that were of no civilization here in this, on this planet. And the people surrounding it taking pictures of the disc crashed on the ground. And uh, we know that that was in fact a genuine disc that was on the ground. So even though the whole project was designed to debunk the UFO phenomenon, it in fact has verified the fact that there is such a, a real historical phenomenon as these flying saucers. What I'm investigating are cases where the craft lands, the occupants get out, they interact with the witnesses, and they produce phenomena, they are wearing different garments and different clothes, their skin color is different, and they get back in the ship and fly away. Those are not piezoelectric phenomena or mental aberrations or anything else. That really happened. And if it happens over and over again, you have more and more witnesses verifying the, the ones before until you have a body of evidence that is indisputable. Yet, somebody will come along and say, oh, it's all, uh, it's all something that they dreamed and they think it's reality. And when that's not the case at all, we have absolute solid reality going on here. One of the most incredible videos that shows intelligently controlled craft moving in our upper atmosphere was taken by NASA's own cameras. This is STS-114, taken in August 2005 from a routine shuttle mission. Looking down at the Earth, we have a night view. The camera on the space shuttle, the astronauts tucked into their space bed sleeping perhaps, while the ever-present camera peers into the murkiness of space, all of a sudden, this light appears out of nowhere and moves in a straight line 
towards the edge of the earth, towards the limb of the earth. Now, as it approaches the edge there, it seems to slow down. But I think what's really going on, it's just moving away from the camera. And it's getting further and further away. And just as it goes out of sight, this massive luminous object comes flying from the other direction. We're talking about a diameter of miles to be throwing off that much light. It slows down and comes to a complete stop. And just as it comes to a stop, another object appears and moves off in yet another direction. And then something truly amazing happens. That huge luminous object starts going backwards. It retraces its steps. Again, something that could only be a sign of intelligent control. The evidence contained in this video should be the subject of a major international press conference. But instead, what does NASA do? They turn their cameras away. The most extraordinary discovery, history of humanity, they want to keep secret. They don't want us to know our true place in the universe. But now we've seen, beyond a reasonable doubt, the reality that's unfolding above our heads, day in and day out. In the small Greek village of Atalande, an extraordinary UFO event occurred. Quite similar in some ways to our American Roswell, New Mexico event of 1947. Just as in the Roswell case, the government swooped in and confiscated every single little piece of debris they could find, hoping to eradicate all evidence that an extraterrestrial craft had been there in the first place. In Greece, we have many impressive events that were reported on the front page of the newspaper. For example, the case of the 10 or 15 spacecrafts that flew around Greece several times and disappeared in the Balkans. These are common events, and we have many of them. One such impressive event occurred in Atalanti, in central Greece, in the year of 1990, on September the 2nd. There was a circular formation of 13 to 15 flying objects. The spacecrafts were very bright in the sky. They arrived early in the afternoon and flew over the area two or three times. Until around one in the morning, when one of them seemed to be damaged. The damaged craft was surrounded by all the others as if they were trying to protect it. They descended and hovered close to the ground looking for a place to land. Finally, they landed in the small town of Atalanti. After landing, some small nervous beings emerged from the spacecraft. Each spacecraft seemed to have only one being. They quickly ran and extinguished the fire with some kind of handheld mechanism. It seemed that they did some repairs on this craft, and around 5 in the morning, all of them flew away. There were some witnesses, some shepherds, in the distance, and they reported to us. The next day, the event was verified by people in nearby villages who saw the lights of the craft all night long. A lot of people went to the land site and they collected many objects left behind. Later on, the staff from the Air Force came over and took the objects from the police. And they sent all these objects to Washington. It becomes a national security problem of great importance when it involves, uh, uh, when this phenomenon involves unique technology, unique to our society and time. And uh, everybody is being is experiencing the same kind of phenomena. They do, they're not just visiting one country or one place. It's happening all over the world. And every place where it happens, they retain the, the, the best evidence for their own information, but always thinking that they've got a piece of the puzzle and they don't want to give that piece to somebody else that might complete his puzzle before theirs. So everybody holds all the pieces to their chest, doesn't release any information, hope to get the information that others have without giving anything in return. And in that sense, it becomes a national security problem because it always represents the potential for a technological breakthrough that would give us an advantage or give an enemy an advantage over all the rest of the world. And so in that sense, it's, it, it's a serious national security problem. And I understand that now. I, I understand where they, why they're doing it.
What the hell is that? It takes a lot less testimony to bring a case in court than it has taken for this UFO phenomenon. You can actually prosecute people on a lot less testimony than we have. The chairman and several other board members of all of the major media in the United States are members of the Council on Foreign Relations. That's why UFO stories can meet the public eye locally, but they don't spread nationally. They can't put that kind of information about the alien presence into the public domain. That is where the general population reads it, like on ABC, unless they have a debunker to give those who aren't ready for that kind of information, aren't ready for aliens, which is probably a majority of the people on the planet, uh, an excuse not to believe it, not to make it part of their reality. You'll notice that Larry King, who also is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, doesn't have someone with a really good story without having somebody from PSYCOP on there to embarrass himself. I mean, they must pay these guys really well to embarrass themselves on those programs that require a debunker. We have such an enormous amount of evidence that aliens are visiting here, even if they're not landing on the White House lawn. Why should they? The president doesn't speak for 6.7 or so billion earthlings. It's a crazy convoluted notion. And I get other people saying, well, if they were coming here, they would have sent a signal first. Sure, like Columbus sent smoke signals to the natives before he went west. That's absurd. We have data. They have none except wishful thinking. Henry Kissinger, Nelson Rockefeller, David Rockefeller, and all of these interests set up a, a virtual disinformation system which discredited all contactees, all public contact with benevolent extraterrestrial civilizations, which ridiculed all of the citizenry, and then which in essence privatized the contact with extraterrestrial civilizations and started an undeclared war against them in order to capture the technology. The STS-48 video is one of the most remarkable pieces of UFO footage that we have. Not only because it shows a near-Earth object under intelligent control being shot at, but it was also taken by NASA's own cameras. An orbiting space shuttle captured this footage of this object which seems to be under its own control, moving along at a very deliberate pace. It heads in a northern direction, then all of a sudden there's a flash of light. We think that this flash of light was the defense system of the Star Wars satellites, a rocket being launched, either from an orbiting satellite or from a ground base station. This object anticipates this and flies off into outer space, and then we see the rocket just shooting straight up. When this footage was recorded, NASA used to stream live their footage from the orbiting space shuttles. Now, all of their video is on delay. There were two Cape Canaverals. I mean, there was Cape Canaveral, which was the NASA Cape Canaveral, and there was the military Cape Canaveral, which was like a gleaming city, I mean, next to the, next to the NASA one in Florida. But you just didn't, you never had access to the, you know, to the military base. So, and at the same time, we're shooting guys up in, you know, in bottle rockets. You know, they're, they're using electromagnetics and anti-gravity and anti-matter and, all of the things that we either got from the Roswell crash in 1947 or uh, got from the Germans from the 1930s and the 1940s. In 1989, I learned I had had alien abduction experiences, and uh, prior to that was very skeptical about it, but ended up going on a trip to Rachel, Nevada, to Area 51, and having a series of sightings. And I went from being very skeptical about the subject of, of UFOs to, to saying, OK, I'm, I'm seeing them. They exist. They're flying in and out of a known top secret military base. And the government is obviously lying about it because they see them you know, flying out here in and out of the space all the time. So I was like, OK, three major belief systems shifted for me overnight. UFOs exist. The government knows about it. And the government's lying about it. This secret is self-keeping and that no nation on the face of the earth could do it if people would open their eyes and would go ahead and open their minds and accept the fact that people are seeing something in the skies that appear to be under intelligent control, exhibiting a technology that we are totally incapable of, 
actually the technology would more be in the realm of magic to most of us. But it is a technology. I can't stress that enough. While you and I might say we are ready to accept that the government coming out and saying that we have visitors from other planets, NASA went ahead and stated we can't really be sure how the population of the world is going to react when we state that we have discovered extraterrestrial intelligence out there in the cosmos, let alone that that intelligence is already among us. Nine saucers landed in this guy's yard, and these humanoid aliens got out and talked to the, talked to the people that lived there. Aliens have been a prime suspect in the cattle mutilation phenomenon. The blood's removed, the rectum's cored out, the sex organs are missing, having been done uh, with incredible surgical precision. I believe that they're here because they have a scientific interest in us and maybe a scientific interest in some of the things we're doing. When I was 15, I was away at school in Rhode Island and um, <clears throat> I was studying physics and mathematics primarily. Um, even though I was in high school, I had a college regime. And um, I had won awards for designing particle accelerators and doing some other interesting things, plasma research and stuff like that. I went home with a fella and his family and um, spending the weekend with them one time. And uh, they wanted to go off shopping somewhere and I just refused to go. Well, I went on a hike and I was out in the woods and it was in the fall, probably October. I encountered this fellow coming out of the woods with a shotgun. And I was very interested in guns in those days, and so we struck up a conversation. And he was telling me all about this shotgun. He asked me if I'd like to shoot it, which I did. And then out of a clear blue sky, he says, um, you know, we've been watching you for a long time. So I looked around and I said, uh, you have some friends with you? Oh, no, he says, that's not what I mean. He said, I'm from Venus. So having grown up in Jersey City, I mean, I was street smart at a young age. There was all sorts of nuts loose. So I figured uh, I was with one of them, you know. And he had the gun, and I didn't. So I figured I'd humor him. And uh, I said, really? So tell me about Venus. And this guy proceeded to tell me all sorts of incredible things about Venus. Um, surface temperature was such and such, too hot, and this and that, and all of the dwellings were underground. And he rambled on for quite some time. At one point, he says, um, well, you know, we know where you go to school, and uh, you're doing some interesting things. So I said, well, really? And I was very surprised. He did know the town that I went to, and he did know the school that I went to, which was a little unnerving. Um, he said something about he was appointed to monitor my case. And um, strangely enough, that's about all I remember of my conversation with this guy. And I walked back to the home of the people that I was staying with, and uh, their car was back, so I figured, good, they're home, you know. I rang the doorbell. The woman came to the door and she was in a state of near hysteria. And she said, what do you mean by doing this, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, well, what are you talking about? And she said, well, you've been gone all day. And I said, well, you gotta be kidding. Oh, no. she said, we have the police out looking for you and everything. But it turns out that I had gone for that walk around 10 in the morning and it must've been about three or four in the afternoon when I got back. So that's a very interesting lost time episode which I have no explanation for. I was working in Connecticut for a small company that was building electric cars, and they had hired me as a director of research and development. The problem that I was given at the time was the development of a new type of transmission for this vehicle. And it was a very difficult thing to design because they wanted some pretty unusual um, performances. And uh, this problem vexed me. It was on my mind for day and night. And uh, this one particular day, I was working with drawings and calculator and whatnot until about three in the morning, and I had really exhausted myself. I decided to quit, took a shower, got ready to bed, got in, and I was uh, running my fingers through my dog's hair, who was curled up at the side of the bed, and I was just in that twilight zone, you know, between awakeness and asleep. And all of a sudden, kind of instantaneously, I was propelled to this other area, this other place. It was a very arid region. I was in a canyon, kind of a rocky canyon. And directly ahead of me was uh, a trapezoidal door that had been cut into the rock, above which was engraved some type of hieroglyphics. And I was compelled to walk through this portal. And I walked into this dark, dank hallway 
that had been cut out of the rock, and immediately I could hear the sounds of heavy machinery. I followed this to the end and it opened up into a vast canyon, cavern that had been carved out. And um, in that space were two gigantic machines that were oscillating or spinning in a very peculiar fashion. The best description I can give you is that they were something like gyroscopes. And my instinct at the time was that they were used to create power for this installation. I have no idea where I was or what this installation was for. But after I studied the machines for a few minutes, I crossed the causeway, went over to the other side of this huge cavern, and went down a flight of stairs into this very brilliant, brilliantly lit room. And this room was set up very much like a, um, a surgical uh, arena. There were operating tables and all sorts of unusual equipment. And in the walls, there were cages embedded in the wall with like steel bars in front of them. And behind these bars were some real unusual creatures. The best description I can give you is that they were something like, um, they were something like creatures from Greek mythology. They were half one species, half another, that type of thing. I didn't dwell there very long. I woke up or snapped back, whatever you want to call it. And my first instinct was to draw these machines before I forgot them. I just slipped into a pair of slippers, ran to the drafting table, and I drew up those machines. And since that time, I've built several of these devices, and they're extremely complicated. I don't know exactly how they work yet, but I've been analyzing them for years, and I, I, think, I still think they are a form of power, power source. The would-be leaders and rulers of this world owe their power to their monopolies over energy, transportation, pharmaceuticals, medicine, etc. They realize that if we understand that there are alternative species out in the universe, then there are alternative energy sources, transportation sources, and it might upset their monopolies. I believe there are 57 or more different species of extraterrestrial life visiting our planet at this time. I base this on a book that I saw while I was in the military. The necessity of that book was to give us some knowledge of first aid that we could render to whatever species we might come in contact to as a result of a crash. There were times that when we'd go to crash sites, uh, we would have some that were injured. And a lot of times, what they called an interfacer, which is what I was uh, a part of, they would have to communicate to the other people there as to what the injuries was and what type of steps they would have to take because they didn't verbalize what they were feeling. It was like mental telepathy. It was like you were picking it up in your mind, but you could hear them like if you and I were talking. You would have a tendency to move your lips, but you didn't have to because they could pick up on what you were thinking at that time. It was a thought transfer process. I heard this roaring sound in my head, and like an electrical feeling started from my head going down my body. My body felt almost weightless. In fact, I actually felt as if my body floated up off the bed. They come into the room, these, these gray aliens with large heads and big black eyes. But they were little men with no hair, and they came right through my bedroom window. The abduction phenomenon occupies most of my time now. This is a situation in which people think that they have been abducted by aliens who are inside the UFOs, and this has happened to them uh, oftentimes, uh, many times. And so uh, uh, they come to me uh, to see exactly what happened to them because they only have very short memories of uh, what happened, little snippets of memories, and sometimes very few memories, but very odd things have happened to them over the years. They all looked alike. They had big black eyes, two little holes for a nose, no discernible mouth, no hair, no ears. Then they take me out, and if I pass through a wall or a window, it feels like I am pa that I'm passing through mud or hard jello. And I remember being floated out the same window. As strange as this sounds, it felt like going through very firm jello. These entities had the ability to go ahead, go through solid objects. Uh, they could appear, disappear, things that would appear to be magic to us. But it's not magic. 
It's technology that's not hundreds of years, but thousands of years ahead of where we're at. And I remember looking down and seeing the, the treetops of my backyard and the roof of my house, and then going straight up. And there's a big round table, and there's a bunch of them moving about. They were somewhere between four and five feet tall, and I remembered them performing medical exams on me. They're taking scrapings of skin. Uh, they're inserting things gynecologically into me, taking things gynecologically from me. I recalled lying flat on my back and being examined by chalky colored alien creatures. I felt so horribly violated. I felt like a rat. I felt like a lab rat. They pulled my rear end back and I and spread my legs apart and I knew it was going to happen at that point. It was like suddenly like it felt like like an air gun. Like a bullet hit the top of my uterus and I knew what they did and it was so incredibly painful. And uh, they had had implanted me with the uh, with a, with a fetus six weeks later. I felt the sensation of something coming out of me and I reached down and I caught it and uh, it was a small, tiny, tiny little fetus. Then I'm standing near this room and I'm watching them put the, the, uh, put the fetus into a round cylinder uh, filled with liquid. Any living species on this planet would have more rights than that entity. And no one was gonna speak out for his rights because officially he and others like him don't exist. The main reason people see UFOs, uh, at least an awful lot of people, is because they're involved in a hybridization program. It's a joint program between Zeta Reticulans and, and humans to develop better bodies to house our souls in future incarnations. And that's something that elected leaders just cannot talk about. No president, whether it's Bill Clinton or Obama or Bush, can stand before the public and say, yes, I'm aware that we have this program with Zeta Reticulans and we're picking up your daughters and your wives and we're taking their eggs, splicing in some, some extra genes to give them a bigger computer bigger hard drive, a faster chip, a new USB port for telepathy. We're re-implanting them and we know what generally they're going to look like and if they look enough like you we let your let the mothers raise them to term. If not they take them at three and a half months, put them in artificial wombs. They have to live elsewhere until the consciousness of the people on this planet is raised to accept them as neighbors. The past seven years, I've been in 42 countries about the world, and I have had uh, discussions uh, with uh, numerous individuals who are involved in the alien abduction phenomena. I've come to believe that approximately 15% of these individuals may have an object uh, within their body as the result of the alien abduction phenomena. We look at the, both the metallurgical and the biological findings, we find some very astounding things. We find that the metal objects are covered with a very strange uh, soft tissue membrane, which is actually attached into the metal. Now that goes uh, far beyond uh, our scientific abilities. Uh, we find also that in the surrounding tissue, there are large amounts of uh, nerve cells uh, which are uh, not correct for the particular area. These are called uh, nerve proprioceptors and perhaps they are responsible uh, for uh, giving the energy supply so that this becomes a functional object. Uh, when we look at the metallurgical findings, uh, we find that uh, there are several unusual things. For example, the objects being uh, uh, metal and highly magnetic uh, contain large amounts of iron, but yet the iron is uh, amorphous iron. It's uh, without crystalline form. Now, I was able to find uh, through uh, black budget laboratories that we do know how to make amorphous metals, but we don't know how to make them magnetic, so that's quite an anomaly. And then the next uh, most telling metallurgical finding is that when we look at the isotopic ratios of some of the metals within the objects, we find that they are non-terrestrial isotopic ratios. So uh, to sum up, uh, we see uh, individuals who allege alien abduction, 
Uh, they find an object within their body which is uh, verified by an X-ray, a CAT scan, or an MRI. They have uh, some distress from the object. Uh, they want them removed, but we accept them as a candidate. The object is removed, submitted for scientific analysis, and then we find things like non-terrestrial isotopic ratios. Then what is a logical person going to conclude other than the fact they are telling you the truth? One of the most unusual objects that I've come across recently is an object uh, that was uh, in the arm of an abductee, and this object moved underneath the skin. When you touched it with your finger, it would move out of the way. And uh, after uh, putting your finger on the area uh, for a while, uh, it began to come to your finger. It would go in the opposite direction. You could move your finger someplace and the object would actually come towards it. Very, very strange, uh, hair-raising, uh, skin-crawling thing to witness, even for me being in the medical field for over 41 years. The alien visitors that we have here have technology that permits them not to just go from a planet within a solar system to another planet within that solar system. They have devised ways to travel vast distances, uh, hundreds, thousands of light years in a very short period of time. We are trying to acquire that same technology. In 93 in August, I had an experience where I was taken by aliens, but at one point I was handed over to military personnel, taken to an underground base, and I had a a very intense medical procedure done on me, gynecological in nature. And then in November of 93, I then had an experience where I went to bed one night and I was awoken by men in camouflage uniform, ripping my covers off my bed and, uh, and proceeding to drug me with a very oily substance. They put me on a stretcher, they carried me out of there. I was taken to a, a base. I was flown on a triangular craft. I ended up going, being taken from one base to another base where I was interrogated about what I knew about alien technology. And it was actually a specific piece, a piece of a drive system uh, that they wanted. There was a missing component of it they couldn't quite figure out, and apparently they were very pleased with the information I gave them. They see us as a species capable of such wonderful things and we can do such horrible, monstrous things to one another. Some years ago I had hypnosis and discovered that I have been an extraterrestrial abductee since childhood. But the reason that I went into hypnosis was because I discovered a very disturbing three-month block of missing time from the time that I was in the military, in the Air Force. When I did finally have hypnosis to discover uh, what happened to me during that missing time, it was very disturbing. Um, I was taken out in the middle of the night to uh, the radar site that uh, I worked on at the Tonopah Electronic Warfare Range. Out there, they had us trying to track extraterrestrial spacecraft or possibly reverse engineered spacecraft. It was a frightening event, not that the craft were frightening, but the circumstances were frightening. After we tried the test, uh, which it didn't seem to me that the radar was tracking the, the UFOs or the ET craft, we were put on a vehicle and taken to what I believe was Area 51. While there, I was injected with an unknown substance. I was taken down a very long flight of stairs and thrown into an observation room while I went through the effects of the injection. It was intensely traumatic. As I was recovering from the effects of the injection, I was dragged out of that room and sexually assaulted by two security guards. Now obviously this is not any woman's uh, girlhood dream to stand in front of a camera and tell people this kind of thing. But I do tell it because I hope that in the telling that I can illustrate that there are things going on in our government that are far and away out of control with no checks and balances. Um, national security and secrets kept for reasons of national security no longer serve the people that they are supposed to protect. A lot of abduction researchers start to feel that this is somehow 
explains away alien abduction and that it's a military in lieu of aliens. In other words, it's a, it's a military covert ops when, quite frankly, a lot of this is, is the intelligence community involvement. It's people in lab coats. It's people in other types of uniforms. There are certainly intelligence operatives involved. And there's military personnel seen in people in military uniforms. So I call it covert ops because I think it includes many black project covert groups that could, that could be involved in some way. In these experiences, a lot of times there's an interrogation involved. And what se they seem to be most interested in are four categories of information. One is the alien agenda and alien motives. Why are they interested in the abductee? Why is this person having this happen? Does the abductee have a sense for why the aliens are interested in them? And what do they know overall? Have the aliens told them about any agenda or motives? What are their plans? Where, where are they taking this? Does the abductee know, or does the abductee have any sense of that? Second, secondly is uh, alien and abductee genetics. There's a lot of medical stuff that goes on, like in my own experience, but that's common to other people who I've had share similar experiences with me. And there's a big interest in what did the aliens do to us medically? Did they alter us medically? Did they alter us genetically? Is there something unique about our genetics as abductees? This is another big thing they seem to be interested in. That's second. Third is paranormal abilities. Does the abductee, are they able to remote view? Are they able to do psychokinesis, telekinesis? Are they able to do telepathy? Do they move matter with their mind? Have they flown a ship and operated equipment on board that, that they have done so with their mind? Can they duplicate that for these covert ops guys? Can they duplicate it under pressure? And it will. Or can they be drugged or used in hypnosis and, and have that enhanced by them where they're able to pull it out even though maybe the abductee isn't able to do it on their own? This kind of thing. So this paranormal component. And then last, but certainly not least, and the biggest of all four, is their interest in the technology. If the covert ops guys have a piece of alien technology, can they hand it to the abductee? And does the abductee know how to operate it? I have many cases of this kind of thing going on. Have they seen the technology? Have they operated? Has it been described to them? Has the propulsion been described to them? Have they seen weaponry? Has the weaponry been described to them? Do they know anything about the cloaking abilities? You know, all this kind of stuff is a big thing that they're interested in. So these are the four categories of information. But again, it suggests that these covert ops really believe these people have had these alien experiences, or why would they be asking them those questions? Now, I want to really emphasize that it is not a military in lieu of alien abduction thesis. It is a covert ops interest in the abductees because they have had very real experiences. And to me, it is some of the strongest evidence in support of alien abduction. If alien abductions aren't real, why would all this be happening? I've been involved in many, many abductions. One mass abduction in particular that I'll never forget the rest of my life. Hundreds of us were shown on tiny little monitors beautiful earth scenes the sea, the mountains, they were drop dead gorgeous. And slowly these scenes deteriorated with pollution and made us very sad. And we were given a message, and the message was, you're killing your planet. Your planet is dying. We must act soon. I was in command of 10 nuclear missiles. The uh, guard was uh, extremely agitated, very fearful, screaming into the phone, uh, saying he was looking at a bright glowing red object just outside the front gate. All the guards were out there, their weapons were drawn. At that point, uh, we got a lot of bells and whistles, alarms. The missiles started to go no-go, which means they couldn't be launched. All in all, we lost nearly 20 missiles uh, to um, UFOs. This is very significant that uh, UFOs seem to be focusing on our nuclear weapons facilities. They're trying to send us a message and that has to do with getting rid of all nuclear weapons on this planet. In 1953, George Adamski witnessed a number of extraterrestrials visiting on their spacecraft and their message was the same. They were very concerned about humanity's testing of nuclear weapons and they were worried that humanity could wipe itself out by the irresponsible use of these nuclear technologies. Gorbachev was uh sitting at the edge of a field when a huge UFO came and landed and a uh, nine foot tall alien came out and told Gorbachev who he was and why he was here and told Gorbachev that Soviet Union needs to have more 
transparency and less repression. The next six days after that, an unidentified object was seen to come in on a straight line toward the center of Verones, a town there in the Soviet Union. And by the seventh day, it had gathered a fairly big audience. I think it was 400 people, and it landed downtown. And that landing did make news around the world. The alien gets out and talks to people for a while, and then a KGB van pulls up and arrests this nine-foot-tall alien. One hour, two, two little aliens get out and start talking to the, to the audience for about an hour, and then the KGB returns the alien, and as he walks back onto the spaceship, the little aliens salute him, and they go close the door and take off. Right after that, Gorbachev did start the programs of Glasnost and Perestroika for more openness and less repression. The military's whole goal was to create a series of satellite bases to then uh, launch a series of missiles or tubes, if you will, up to the moon and then have a series of astronauts go up there and just screw all these tubes together and create sort of an instant moon base that they could then have the high ground of space. And it was called Project Horizon. Project Horizon was probably getting 20 times more money than, than uh, NASA was getting at that time. So uh, the whole NASA thing was just a front, but it was the civilian peaceful pursuit of space while the military rather savagely went after the military application of space. The military uh, mind has prevailed and the U.S. is going to spend hundreds of billions of dollars to, uh, to put uh, a base on the moon. And a couple of things bother me about that, I guess. First of all, if uh, the moon is used as an advanced base for some of the extraterrestrials, as has been widely rumored, I don't know what kind of uh, reception the uh, American uh, uh, pioneers will get when they get there. And secondly, the amount of money that's involved to use it on a project as questionable as this, when millions of people are starving on, on Earth for lack of proper food and water and medical care, I just think is a very, very bad way to spend resources. And I just think it, well, frankly, I think it's immoral. For what purpose? For the purpose of maintaining the permanent war economy on this planet in defiance of the will of the people of this planet, i.e. giving them informed consent, in defiance of the proper uh, care of the ecology of this planet, where we're caretakers of what is, in essence, a universe commons. The, the human race does not have right title and interest to this planet. To date, we've never had any situations where they were hostile. We, we've been hostile, but they haven't been hostile. We have had situations where uh, we would shoot at them, and here again, it's human to go ahead and strike out at something you fear or something that's unknown. And that's the nature of the human species. The NRO has now developed radar which tracks the extraterrestrial light ships in the next dimension over. So this is the deployment of practically the entirety of space weapons against the friendly, integrated, higher plan, universe plan for the positive evolution of this planet. I personally believe that Eisenhower did indeed meet with these extraterrestrial off-world astronauts. I would like to submit to our nation my personal testimony of one document related to one of these ongoing topics which I saw while in office serving on the State Federal Relations and Veterans Affairs Committee. The document I saw was an official brief to President Eisenhower. To the best of my memory, this brief was pervaded with a sense of hope, and it informed President Eisenhower of the continued presence 
of extraterrestrial beings here in the United States of America. The brief seemed to indicate that a meeting between the president and some of these visitors could be arranged as appropriate if desired. The tone of the brief indicated to me that there was no need for concern since these visitors were in no way causing any harm or had any intention whatsoever of causing any disruption then or in the future. When we look at this video, we have to ask ourselves, how many other craft have we shot at? How many other craft have we shot down? And if we ourselves are ever to become a spacefaring civilization, can we expect the same hospitality when we visit other worlds? Take the U.S. National Missile Defense System. Well, that's a trillion dollar weapon system. That's the most expensive weapon system in the history of the world. And that's a weapon system which will develop the technology for putting space-based platforms and space weapons, laser weapons, space-based interceptors in space uh, in order to attack benevolent extraterrestrial civilizations that are really here on an integrated galactic plan for the benefit of our planet. I doubt that there's a single member of Congress that's in the loop as far as the alien secret is concerned. I doubt if there's one. I'll bet you that they, there are a lot of things that they're financing that they don't know about. This is a dereliction of duty on their part because they have a responsibility to be protectors of the public purse and to know what they're doing, and uh, I don't think they do. How can you have proper civilian control of the military if they don't know what's going on? Shortly before 9-11, in the summer of 01, Rumsfeld told the Senate that they could not track 2.3 trillion dollars in transactions. Now just to put that in context, the Pentagon's official budget for that fiscal year was about 310 billion dollars or one-eighth the amount. How is it possible to lose eight times your annual budget? After 9-11, that question, that is the missing Pentagon money, literally became tabled as a matter of national security. What is clear is that there's a lot of money flowing through federal offices that is of uncertain origin and of uncertain destination. And that's a perfect way to siphon out billions and trillions of dollars for all kinds of covert activities that have no oversight whatsoever. Interestingly enough, the majority of fatalities at the Pentagon on 9-11 involved members of the Army's accounting office, the very people who would be looking into the missing $2.3 trillion. One of the important things I think that they would want us to understand and we need to understand eventually is that we sometimes go ahead, don't worry what happens to the other guy. I tell you it is very important to be concerned what happens to others. That ties into universal love and universal good. We haven't gotten the message because it's okay if it happens to the other guy. It's not okay if it happens to us. But always remember this, to the other guy, you are the other guy. Well, I was in Switzerland investigating a, the case of Billy Meyer. One of the ladies there, a multilingual translator, told me I should look into a Dutch case down in Holland. And she gave me the name and the telephone number of the witness. She said, he's a, a well-known man, he, he, he'll tell you about the case, but he won't let you use his name or image or anything. I said, that's fine. I'd like to know the details. She said, well, the details are really remarkable because they're uh, extraterrestrial visitors that can go underwater with their craft. So I went to Holland and looked the man up. He was a tall man. He was uh, almost seven feet tall. He's a giant man, very, very kind person. He had a nice family, a wife and a teenage daughter and son. The family had a private shock. It's a flat bottom, small yacht that one person can sail. And they were sailing recreationally in the Ooshel, the West Sea, south of Rotterdam. When they struck an object in the clear channel, the yacht bounced off from it. After he struck something in the water, he looked over the rail and saw a body floating. His quick first reaction was to jump over the rail and rescue the body. 
when he turned it over, he saw a completely different morphology. The features were different, everything was different. He picked it up in his arms and he was wading on this underground, underwater surface that was now rising. It came up above the water level and, and a, a black tower rose out of the center out of it. The door opened in the side and another being in a suit just like the one in his arms came out and took the second one out of his arms and took it down inside. Then he came right back to the door of the, of the little tower and said, thanked him for rescuing his fellow. The family spent the night in the chalk in the clear channel. So when the aliens emerged again in the morning, they moved him a little closer out of the channel to a side of the channel and submerged again after taking him aboard. They sat him in front of viewing screens and showed him how to use controls to zoom and pan on images that came up on the screen. And then they allowed him to ask questions. When he looked to his right, there was a curved blue glass window with three or four of these creatures, just like the one that he had rescued, facing him through the glass, watching him ask the questions, and they were using some controls and bringing images up on the viewing screens for him to observe. When he asked about their living, how they lived, they brought up images of their apartment complexes, their homes, even the interiors of their homes. When he asked about their, uh, their, their commercial facilities, they showed him shopping centers in their apartment complexes. He asked about agriculture. They showed him automated agricultural systems that produce all of the, the foodstuffs automatically. He, uh, they told him that the land surface of their planet was less than ours, that there was about 20% land surface, was ours was about 35%. They are semi-aquatic creatures. Their population density on their planet was considerably more than ours, but they have a lot of aquatic activity. They live near the water and they can even stay underwater for up to 30 minutes like a seal and then come back up for air, whereas we, we, we don't have those capabilities. They, it's just part of their nature, their physiology and their society. And they have underwater creatures that, uh, that they farm. Uh, it's a unique society, but it was completely different from ours. Their morphology was different, their sciences were different, their technology was different, their foodstuffs were different, everything was different and they're just as ambient as we are and can get around the stars and we can't even leave this planet and go any place yet. Perhaps the most important question the human race has ever asked is who are we and where do we come from? Well, after 30 years of research on our work, I believe I know an answer. The answer is we didn't come from here, we came from Mars. The Russians back in the late 50s, early 60s, did about a 30-page report in which they were, some of their scientists were concluding that there was Martians and that they actually lived inside of two moons of, of Mars. There's a similarity between all this megalithic construction that's all over the world and even structures like obelisks and pyramids and huge platforms can be found on our moon. And I maintain that even the NASA missions have uh, discovered what seem to be structures on the moon, and they're essentially covering up these discoveries. But the idea that we have, say, extraterrestrial structures on the moon and, and, and probably on Mars too, and that there's a similarity between those structures on the moon and Mars and many of these structures that are found here on Earth. I would like to recount a session I had with a young 13-year-old girl in 1996, which is about 15 years ago. She suddenly recounts that she can see a red planet, and she said it's, it's a red planet that has a face on it. She said, it's really strange face, but it's, you know, it's an amazing face. And then she proceeds to say that she's seeing under the ground there are beings there. And these beings are telling her that we come from there. And this alone was quite amazing, but on top of that, she then says, I'm seeing an American flag. Now, this is in 1996. And at the time, I didn't really know what to make of it. But since that time, I discovered, of course, the face on Mars. There is a sense now that there may very well be life of some kind on Mars. But the most incredible thing is we are now hearing from whistleblowers 
that there is some form of jump gate and the military, there are some military that actually are going to secret bases on Mars. So this young lady, 15 years ago, was saying some of what could actually be now absolutely credible. And I find this um, has great veracity coming from a 13-year-old girl that knew nothing about any of this at that time. Individuals have come forward to reveal that human-looking extraterrestrials are living and walking amongst us. In 1975, a Swiss farmer by the name of Billy Meyer had a number of interactions with extraterrestrial visitors that lasted for a number of years. They came in ships that were witnessed by Meyer and a number of other independent individuals. Maya took photographs of these ships. One of these visitors was named Semjasi. She was a very beautiful extraterrestrial female who gave Maya a philosophy of how humanity could deal more responsibly with the environment, with the rest of humanity, and with the other species on the planet. The evidence is overwhelming now. The evidence is so great now. It's, it, it, it's, it's impossible to just say it's nonsense. People who say it's nonsense do not understand what this phenomenon is about. It is amazingly important, and I do think that uh, this is, in fact, an existential threat. I began to hear stories of people uh, moving into society, uh, hubrids who are moving in in twos and threes and fours into apartments. They are moving into many apartments. Abductees are helping them the title of Walking Among Us comes from my favorite question. And the question was, uh, with people when I would do interviews, do you think they're living here? Do you think they're walking among us? And I got to say, absolutely not. <laughs> There's no evidence whatsoever that they are walking among us. I can't say that anymore. This is an extremely important program for them. This is not a sort of a vacation type deal, or they're just coming to examine us and see what we like. This is a whole different uh, story. And the best thing that I can say, and this is a guess, this is speculation, I don't know, but the thing that fits the, the best is what I call planetary acquisition. This is in fact the taking over of the planet itself for reasons that we do not know, but the best thing that I can say that is probably irrefutable if this is planetary acquisition, it benefits them. In some way, it benefits them. That's all we know about it. There's a lot of controversy about what the reasons are for the cattle mutilations, who's doing it, mm -hmm. if it's the government, if it's aliens, if they're in sync together, there's some kind of agenda. I think there, there is a large body of very compelling evidence that we are dealing with an alien intelligence behind the cattle mutilations. I think the rest is, is speculation as to why an alien intelligence would be interested in a bovine rectum. I can't think of any other precedent in history where the perfect crime has been perpetrated eight, ten thousand times uh, with no one ever being caught over 30 years. I would go out into the field and they would say, yeah, we saw the black helicopter, but we also saw a flying saucer. So I went, oh my goodness, uh, well maybe the government's got flying saucers too. So then the further I dug, the people would say, yeah, we saw the aliens bent over the cow and they levitated the cow up into a flying saucer and then the black helicopters came the next morning and then, so this curious mix started to evolve. As I got out into the field and I investigated and I talked to these ranchers and, and, and found that they were obviously sincere and had no reason to fabricate these stories, I started to take them more seriously. There were flying saucers flying everywhere around, right here where we are, around these, this mountain range. It was saturated with what we call flat, uh, classic flying saucers. Last year I was in Roswell, New Mexico, uh, giving a talk, and I ran into an old research friend of mine who's uh, a very reputable scientist. He worked for Sandia Labs for 29 years. Uh, quite respected, a high security clearance. I was having a little chat with him, and he said, the aliens are taking bacteria from these cows and using it to nurture hybrid babies in space. Then he went on to say that his wife, he and his wife had voluntarily consented to have alien hybrid babies, uh, and the babies were gone. I said, well, then he said, well, they're probably on other planets right now. They took them off, and we said it was okay. We're trying to help this program of 
of populating the universe with these hybrid babies. And I said, okay. <laughs> I mean, he was totally sincere. Here's a man that's 29 years with Sandia Labs. He and his wife produced hybrid alien babies, and he, the aliens told him that they had to have this bacteria from the cattle to be able to sustain these babies in space. Who am I to say? Muchas personas en Puerto Rico todavía se preguntan sobre el misterio que rodea la Laguna Cartagena, que ubica en el barrio Maguayo del pueblo de Lajas, un pueblo al suroeste de Puerto Rico, donde se han avistado militares. Las personas también han visto de estos seres pequeños, los aliens, los que llaman los grises, también los han visto. Yo les pregunto a ustedes, ¿por qué están allí? ¿Qué hace el gobierno federal que adquirió esos terrenos? ¿Y por qué mucha gente está comentando esto? Pero no trate de investigarlo, porque si así lo hace, el gobierno lo pudiera matar a usted. For many years, various researchers have attempted to bring to light what the government prefers to deny. Coincidentally, many of these brave people ended up dead. William Cooper, former naval intelligence officer, exposing in behold a pale horse pervasive government lies and crimes, implants, mind control, and secret genetic engineering through alien abductions. Shot to death in front of his house in 1999 by a posse of sheriff's deputies dressed as hippies. Ferris Schneider, geologist and explosives engineer, found strangled to death in 1996 after publicly revealing the existence of aliens in the secret underground government bioengineering lab in Dulce, New Mexico. Colonel Philip Corso in his book, The Day After Roswell, explained that the true purpose of Reagan's Star Wars anti-missile system was to protect us not from the Russians, but from potential invaders from space. 22 scientists and computer geeks working on the Star Wars anti-missile system back in the 80s, all 22 dead between 1985 and 1988, under mysterious, if not violent, circumstances. All working on secret weaponry to bring down alien spacecraft, all dead within less than three years. To what lengths won't they go to keep this thing a secret? When it comes to our visitors, our extraterrestrial visitors, what really counts and the most important thing is the truth. Governments do not have a right to lie to their people. And our government, they have a constitutional obligation to tell the people the truth. This is not a matter of national security. It's a matter of national fact that we have visitors that did not originate on this earth. a growing number of people in the world who are now perfectly convinced that several, at least, other civilizations, non-human civilizations, exist in our own Milky Way galaxy. And in fact, the United States Congressional Research Service, as pointed out earlier, has concluded that there are at least two to six other such highly technologically developed civilizations in our own Milky Way galaxy. And it's important to understand that there are 500 trillion galaxies. So the probabilities of our being visited by any number of other civilizations is uh, looming in the immediate future. Indeed, the Vatican uh, in Rome back in November of 2009 held a five-day conference and at the end of that conference discussing the potential contact with an extraterrestrial civilization the members of the press conference held at the Vatican concluded that it is very possible that we will be confirming the existence of such a civilization within the next very few years. And they have called upon our human family to begin to give very serious consideration to the philosophical and theological implications 
of our upcoming contact with a non-human extraterrestrial civilization. It is now time for those of us in the world who now come to know that this is true, for us to no longer wait for governments to tell us that it's true, or for major institutional religions to tell us what it is that we're supposed to think about this. The time has come for us as citizens of the world to begin to gather together to discuss not just whether this is true, but the full philosophical and theological implications of the upcoming contact with a non-human, highly developed civilization. We aim for the stars today. We try to achieve that technology. Tomorrow, we will achieve that technology. We will achieve interstellar travel, meaning that we're going to be able to go from one solar system to another solar system. When that happens, day after tomorrow, we are going to become somebody else's UFO.